right. Good morning, church. How's everybody? Weather is perfect. You can't complain at all. This is perfect. Love it. I'm going to talk about a view from the rock. I'm going to talk about our mission statement, disciple leaders who transform culture. I was thinking in this setting right here, uh, there's a little flashback. When I go to Pakistan, I've uh, been there four times now. One of the questions I asked early on is, here you're in a country that has 2% Christians, 98% Muslims. Uh, the question is, how do you evangelize Muslims? He said, every time you speak, because most of the times you speak in a lot, a vacant lot in the middle of a village, and they get speakers like twice as tall, twice as wide as those, and they said, your voice carries a half a mile. So when you preach and I interpret, there's villages that hear the message of Jesus Christ. So just so you know, when I mentioned Pakistan, that's some of the things that happen right there. And so to me, that's absolutely exciting. So when we talk about a view from the rock, here's, here's what I want to talk about when it comes to view and perspective. The world looks much different from 38,000 feet than it does at ground level. If you've been in a plane and you're up 38,000 feet and you look, uh, you look at the planet, what do you see? You know, you, you see some white, uh, you see some green, you see some blue, you see some brown, but it's very different. <clears throat> it's very impersonal. It's very unrecognizable. But what happens when you descend? What happens when you finally make it to ground level? Everything looks different and it becomes very personal and it becomes very alive. When you get close to the world, it becomes, the closer you get, the more alive it becomes. If you look at the Bible from a distance, it can be a book on a shelf like any other book. It can have pages, it can have binding, it can have writing, it can have numbers and paragraphs, and from a distance, it looks like literature, it just looks like a book, like any other book. But when you get close to the Bible, and you open it up, and you read it for yourself, it becomes alive. The closer you and I get to Scripture, the more alive it becomes. The world and the Bible come alive when we get close. The challenge is that you and I are marketed Bible and Bible things in a way that appeals to our consumer nature. It's marketing at its best. In this culture, in this country, here's how it goes. It's almost like God is the waiter at a buffet asking Christians, well, what would you like today? What are you in the mood for? Well, I think I'd like a little wisdom. Um, I think I'll have a couple Proverbs. Perfect. Here's a couple Proverbs of wisdom. Take that. Oh, that's good. That felt good. Oh, might I interest you in a little Leviticus? Ah, that's a little meaty for me. I'm going to pass on that. I'm, I'm Leviticus free. I'm gluten free. I, got, I can't handle that. Well, then I would suggest we just go over to 1 John. Very short, very compact, a lot about love. You'll feel good. You can read it really quickly. That sounds really good. But I would also suggest some Romans. Ooh, that's too much meat. I'm kind of a vegan person. So I think I'm going to stay. Well, well, what else would you like for dessert? Oh, a couple Psalms. But the ones that comfort, not the ones that talk about how hard and suffering this, my life is. And the problem is that when you read it as a reference book, you take what you want as opposed to the story that God intended it be for you and I to be invited into. All right, it's just, you know, just a little thought. When it comes to identity, when it comes to community, and when it comes to mission, it only becomes alive when you get close to it. Mission is what the whole Bible is about. God's mission to create, recreate, save, disciple, deliver, redeem, restore, and implement his kingdom on this earth as it is in heaven. That's mission. It's getting involved in what God is doing, where he wants it done, and how he wants it done. When you think about it, I always, you know, one time I just, I, I just got a hankering to find out where all the miracles in the Gospels took place. And so I went through every miracle that Jesus performed in the Gospel, and without exception, all but two miracles were outside of the synagogue. 
Out of all the miracles Jesus performed, and I think it records 35 of them, only two were in the synagogue. The rest of them were in the highways, the byways, the neighborhoods, and the villages. I love the church. I love the church most when the church is the church where it's supposed to be the church, out of the building. Out of the building. So I want to I wanna, um, read you a short story. And I love this story because on one level, it's so simple that you can't miss it. But on the other hand, it's so sophisticated that it really confronts people that are experts in religion. And it's the story of the Good Samaritan. Everybody say Good Samaritan. Is there anybody that doesn't know what that is in some way? You've never heard of the Good Samaritan. Do you know that phrase is congruent around the world? Everybody around the world has heard that phrase, heard that saying. Most people kind of know the origins of the Good Samaritan. So I want to take a look at this and I want to think about it in the context of, of mission, uh, mission and vision and you and I in our daily lives. And it starts in Luke chapter 10. In fact, Luke chapter, chapter 9 and chapter 10 are really the first missions aspect in the Gospels. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law. So this is somebody that's an expert in the law of Moses. He's an expert in the Torah, the Pentateuch, the Old Testament, first five books of the Bible. And he stood up to test Jesus. Now, I can tell you, testing Jesus, tempting Jesus, provoking Jesus is never really a good move. It's not a good play. It really isn't. And this guy's an expert. So what Paul says about knowledge is that it puffs up. And so you've got somebody that knows a lot. He's an expert, and he's a little puffed up. And so what he wants to do is he wants to test Jesus. Literally, it means that he wants to trap and discredit Jesus. This is the expert. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I would say that's a great question. That is really the number one question everybody needs to ask. Jesus said, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? I love it. You're, you're, going to see the, you're going to see the subtle turning of the tables. Jesus asked questions. In fact, if you want to know, and I, some, and I know some of you are dying to know it, how many questions did Jesus personally ask? In the Gospels, he asked 305 questions. We tend to think teaching is from a lecturer to a student. It's about information tra you know, transcended to the person receiving it. But it's not. A way that Jesus taught was he asked questions. He's always asking questions. And so he just turns and he asks this guy, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And that would be really normal of, of uh, religious experts in the law, priests, Levites. They would do that. They would read portions and they'd say, how do you read it? And then he would give his dissertation or his commentary and say, how do you read it? And so that's just kind of normal language. And then so Jesus does the same thing. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. I want you to notice what Jesus said. He said, do this and you will live. He didn't say, know this and you will live. You're telling me Jesus isn't just looking for the correct answer to a theological question? Exactly. He's not just looking for right answers. This guy gives the right answers. Jesus said, do this and you will live. You can have the right answers to spiritual questions, the right theology. You can ace all the, 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 the classes and the lectures in seminary, and you still have a heart that's not right in alignment with God. You can still have a hard heart with a mass, mass of theological education. And so Jesus doesn't leave it just at what you know. He says, do this, and you're going to live. And I love what it, what it means there. It means that you're going to live, and you're going to be active, and you're going to be blessed, and you're going to enjoy real life on God's terms. And, that, and it, it also means that you won't be dead. You won't be dead. So he's really giving some great keys here. You see, because Jesus knows transformation is congruence between what you and I believe and how we behave. That's where transformation is. This is not what you know. I've known a lot of people over the years that know a lot of theology, that have memorized vast portions of Scripture that were absolutely impressive. But because there was a lack of obedience, there was a deadness in their life. 
And so Jesus is really just calling that out. Do this, and you're going to live. You see, as much as we want just, you know, give me some scriptures that feel good that I can highlight, make a little asterisk, a little footnote, have a little feel good. You've got to remember there's over 100 verses in the Gospels that really require obedience. Not just a yes in the head, but behavior that's changed in light of that. 100 verses on obedience. Jesus said this. You may not have this underlined in your Bible. Why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? So apparently there's people that call him Lord, but don't do what he says. But this guy, he wanted to justify himself. That's not good either. So he asked Jesus, and so who is my neighbor? Oh, this is going to go good, isn't it? So now we've got a little story time with Jesus. I love this. Story time with Jesus is the best. Who's my neighbor? Because the Jews said, fellow Israelites are neighbors. Non-Israelites are non-neighbors. That's in their writings. That's in their history. That's what he's bringing to the table. But he's asking that question. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is called the Bloody Way. It's approximately 15 to 17 miles downhill from Jerusalem to Jericho, and there was a lot of robbers that hung out there, and there was a lot of people that would get robbed and taken advantage of on, on this road. And he happened to go down this road, and he happened to go, oh, hold on, hold on, back up. He was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Here's what you and I know, that brokenness is always in layers. And there's the obvious wounds that we have. And this guy had obvious wounds in the story. It's a parable. But then there's the inobvious wounds. There's the unseen wounds. So we always have to remember that sometimes the people that look the most together on the outside are some of the most broken on the inside which is why things like community are very important. When you spend time with people and you, you, what happens in community and what happens when you and I fellowship regularly is at some point you and I have to come to a conclusion that the person that I'm interacting with can either be trusted or not trusted. If they're trusted, then that's where you invite them into your pain. That's where you invite them into the unseen wounds that you have. That's why Jesus will never tell somebody just to throw money at someone. He believes in a holistic approach. That's why when it comes to, you know, like one of the agencies that we support is AIM, Agape International Missions. They rescue girls that have been uh, out of sex trafficking. It never stops with just getting them out of immediate exploitation and danger. That's just the start. After that comes the counseling, comes the healing, comes the love comes the building the bridges, comes the gospel, comes the transformation, comes the here's how to do a new trade. It's holistic. And that's what we believe here. We don't believe in just going and throwing money at the poor or just throwing money at brokenness. No, we think the way Jesus thinks, and it's holistic. When you go, when you go to Pakistan, when you go to Haiti, we've been, many of us here have been, you will see poverty. You, that's, you will see. When you go to Haiti, you will, you will see nothing but poverty. And let me say, that's why we go there. We want to go to the places that are least resourced. And I've explained it to people that have never been on a, on a trip, never gone to Haiti. I will show them pictures. I will say, this is what you're going to encounter. This is what you're going to see. It is poor. Everywhere you look, it's poverty, poverty, poverty. It's not like, wow, there's a nice neighborhood. Wow, there's some poverty. Wow, there's, there's some more poverty. There's some more nice houses. No, 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 no. I've had people literally on the bus ride to where we go for an hour and a half look out the windows and say, I had no idea. I had no idea. I can explain it till the cows come home, but until you're there and you see it and you touch it and you experience it and you smell it, it's a whole different deal. But once again, the church is not meant to be a humanitarian aid organization. It's meant to be comprehensive holistic Jesus transformation from the inside out. The outside is great. You can feed people, you can build houses for people, and you should, and we do, but if the heart's not changed, they die with a house, or they die with some money, or they die with some food. And that's not the goal of this gospel that you and I read, that you and I believe. 
So I want to give you just a couple of snippets of some things. Uh, you know, got back from uh, Pakistan a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and I want you to, when, when, I want you to get the bigger picture of when we go on these trips. So if you're looking at your phone, at your notes, uh, you'll see a picture right now. If you're watching online, there will be a picture. It'll be a picture of 30 women. And about nine months ago, when I went over there and talking to my friend over there, he said, what really needs to happen here is, is we need to get people educated. <clears throat> so I've preached in different churches and different uh, venues outside and parking lots and, and different things. And, and I've asked him, how many, how many of these people can read? And he said, 1%. I said, no, 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 wait a minute. You, you tell me out of all these people, only 1% can even read? He said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. So we've got to get education. So he said, we're going to start a, a Montessori teacher's training school. I said, I'm in. That sounds good. So he introduced me to these 30 ladies. And let me tell you, these were ladies that could read. They had a little teaching skill, uh, but they were stuck at a really low level and would never be used. And so... They invested in these 30 women. women. <clears throat> and I can tell you, I've got a picture of them before. And, and, and then five months later, when I went back, I went to their, uh, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a graduation. It was kind of, a, kind of an update deal. And so I get there, and now all these women who were pretty somber the five months before that, they had them each stand up and give a different lesson based on what they've learned. And so for a long time, man, we were... We were just sitting there, and they were getting up, being animated, teaching all these different things that they learned. And you're thinking, that is absolutely awesome. I'm going to go back in November. They're going to graduate. Okay, so once again, it's just not taking 30 women, teaching them how to teach. It's what do you do? What is sustainable and what's multipliable? And then this is where it goes from there. So out of these 30, these poor villages that I go to, most of the kids don't get any education. Because the schools that they would have to go to, they would be bullied because they're Christians. It would be very dangerous. It would be very exploitive. Girls would get harassed sexually. And so the parents don't let them go to school, which means they will grow up with no education and they will work as a slave in a factory. They will be making bricks by hand. And I've seen the brick factories there. And it's dirty and it's hot. And that's their lot in life. But somewhere along the line, when you touch that and when you see that, you say, we have so much here, that's just not right. Something's got to be done. And so what's going to happen is we started talking, and out of those 30 women, we're going to take three. There was 60 to 80 kids one time just sitting out on a patio in this little courtyard. None of them go to school. None of them been to school, and none of them will go to school. And so I said, how many of you, and this will be the second picture that you see, how many of you would want to go to school? All these kids, all ages, raise their hand. I said, how many of you believe God can create a school for you? All these kids raised their hands. I said, let's pray that you have a school to go to. Got on my knees, we prayed. So what's going to happen is some of the women that graduate from the teacher training are going to start a school in these poor Christian slums. And little kids that had no chance are going to have Jesus and education. And that's a big deal. And that's just there. And so then the third picture you're going to see is you're going to see a picture of a thatch house on a rock in Haiti up in the middle of nowhere. And it's a family of five or six that Hurricane Matthew completely took their house and dwelling out. And so they have a thatched little structure, and all of them live there. And I've been into their house a couple of times, and it's just palm branches and thatched weaving and a dirt floor and like two woven beds out of palm and a little wood, and they all sleep in the same room. And I asked the guy down there, I said, you know, who needs the, the next house we're going to build? Uh, and he said, that, that family right there sent me a picture. I said, I agree. Perfect. So in a couple of weeks ago, in a couple of weeks, a few of us are going to go down there, and we're going to start building this house for that family. And so if you want to give, church, you can go to our website, go to the giving, and then you'll see a little tag that says, Haiti 4225. Did I get that right, Nick? What? I got it right. I'm excited. 4225 Haiti Projects. And so if you want to give to that, hey, we're going we're gonna to go build a house. Also, we'll be dedicating a church that was finished in January, but because of COVID couldn't get down there. And so we're going to dedicate a church that used to be mud and stones. And now it's a nice church up there. So that's what's going on globally. Back to the story here. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. 
So to a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him, he passed on the other side. So you've got a priest and a Levite, religious people. You know, Levites were like the assistant priests. Priests did the sacrifices. They took care of the temple. Isn't it interesting, when you and I are around the world, the term the good priest or the good Levite is not associated like the good Samaritan is. Ask anybody. Hey, have you heard of the good priest? No. Ever heard of the good Levite? Mm, no. Ever heard of the good Samaritan? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, you can YouTube it. I give you permission. YouTube the good Samaritan. Tons of stories about people helping people in dire straits. Great stuff. See, here's the deal. The two guys passed because they were coming, and this is the irony of it. They were coming from religious activity. They were coming from the temple. They were leaving worship. And they encounter this guy half dead. And they make choices. They see him. It doesn't mean they didn't, you know, maybe I saw him. No, it, they saw him. They went, wow, that dude is not looking good. That's, he's in bad shape. We're going to make a decision. We're going to make a choice. And we're going to walk on by. And that's what they did. You know why? Because they valued purity over pity. Staying clean. Not touching somebody like that was the high priority. Then Jesus says, now, you've got to capture this. But a Samaritan, everybody say Samaritan. Okay, without going into all the history, you need to understand that Jews looked at Samaritans with animosity and contempt. When Jesus, as soon as Jesus inserts Samaritan in this story, you need to understand they are borderline going out of their minds. These people had polluted worship. These people that weren't per, pure Jews. These are people that the Jews had excommunicated and labeled them as devils and heretics. Okay, that's the mindset of the Jew in that day that Jesus is telling this story. Samaritan, but a Samaritan. No, no. But Jesus is going there. You know why? Because there's a part of Jesus that loves to be controversial. He's not afraid of political correctness. He's not afraid of that. He's willing to stir the pot. And he's stirring the pot big time right now. He's confrontational. Samaritan. He traveled, came by where the man was, saw him, took pity on him, and he went to him. And he bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine on him. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him into an inn, and took care of him. Can I tell you that loving broken people is a hassle? It's inconvenient. It's never convenient. Nobody's broken at the right time. Nobody's addicted at the right time. Nobody in need of de deliverance. Is it's never convenient. It's never at the right time. It's never at a prescribed 4 to 6 p.m. This is going to be the ideal time to minister to this person. No, it's always on the way somewhere. It's, it's always inconvenient. Going, you know, every time I get up, I don't want to be a martyr here because I'm not, but this last trip to, to, to Pakistan, I had to get a COVID test seven, within 72 hours of going and show the proof that I was negative. When I got there, oh, then you have to wear a mask and a face shield, okay? That's inconvenient. But the funny thing is, is watching how many people with a mask, mask and shield, get their meal and run their fork into their face. That was hysterical. That was absolutely worth it. And I only did that once or twice. And that was, I laughed at myself. That's how I was feeling. Oh, this is good. Oh, that's right. I got a shield on. Then I have smudged whatever was on there. So it's inconvenient. And then when you get there, it's 100 and some degrees. And it's, it's hot and sweaty and stinky. And then you have to have another COVID test. And so you have to have those results within 72 hours. And so you go to this place, and the COVID tests here, which I've had two, are nothing to be compared to the COVID test there. Because there, they don't swab, they gouge. I'm not kidding. It's a good thing. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm just telling you. He, he went up, up. You know what I said to him? He's going, uh, uh, uh. I'm going, no, no, no. He goes, yes, yes, yes. And he's sticking my thing. He, I know there's not supposed to be blood on the end of that swab. I know it. It's just supposed to be clear stuff. But no, he found pay dirt, man. He found it. And there was blood on the end of that thing. And then he goes down my throat, both nostrils. Disgusting. A hassle. Yes. Inconvenient. Yes. Worth it. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
So this is just, you know, this guy right here, it's inconvenient. It's going to cost him money. He gives money to the innkeeper. He said, look after him. The amount of money he gave was the equivalent of two months' rent. That's a big deal. You know, um, I want to close with this. Sometimes when you go to other countries, you always think, you know, what I have to give them. But God always turns it around and confronts me with what I need. You see, you, we can talk about love and, and, and all this, and we can come up with some good stories and all that, and people would go, oh, yeah, that's mm, touching. But then, then you get confronted with this kind of thing. This lady comes up to me. Her name's Ruby. She's in Pakistan. Through the translator, she says, I want you to pray that I have a son. Oh, absolutely. Love that prayer. Gets answered a lot over there. It's, it's great. So, yeah. And then she says this. I gave my only son. I said, what, what, do you, what, what happened? What, what do you mean? Through the translator, she says, my brother and his wife tried to have children for eight years and couldn't. So I gave them my son. You know, you hear stuff like that, you go, geez, I don't think I'm there yet. I got sons. I wouldn't give them away. Maybe one of them. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I wouldn't, but just try to wrap your mind around that. Your own, and she said that, my only son. I'm thinking there should be a scripture about that. There is a scripture about that. You missed your cue, but I forgive you. I love you. And so I said, yeah, let's pray. We're going to pray. That's what I know. In my knower, she's going to have a son. You know why I believe that? Because I believe we're going to pray for her. Her name's Ruby. Everybody say Ruby. We laid hands on her. We prayed. I'm believing Ruby has a child. So whenever you're going through your day and you hear Ruby, the stone, Ruby, be quickened to pray for Ruby to have a son. That's our prayer. That's what we want to do. So you see this story, you know, I mean, ignorance is not bliss. Mission is really going and giving the life that God has given you to people that need your very same life. And you know, it's the reason missions happen happens here at The Rock is because our church does three things. They go. In the last five years, there's been 250 people that have gone on mission trips. They go and they pray. Because when I go, people come and tell me, we're putting, we're putting reminders on our phone to pray for you every day. And I can tell you, I don't know exactly what difference it makes, just that I know it does make a difference. And in some weird way, you just feel really covered knowing. And then I'll get a text occasionally, you know, I'll wake up, hey, we're praying for you. It's a big deal. It's a really big deal. And then other people give. You know, they say, I can't go right now, but I can pray and I can, I can give. And I just want to tell you, giving is a big deal. It's a big, big, big deal. So I want to pray. I want to pray for us. And let's stand up together. It's so good to see you. Let me, um, let me ask you a question. How many of you have been going down the road, whatever the road means to you, you saw somebody that was in need, you felt a little something in your heart that you were supposed to do something, but you drove on by or you walked on by? Can, can I see your hands? Please do not let me be the only person up here because that would be horrible. I would give you the mic and tell you to preach it. But it's true. We've all done it. <clears throat> and we can embrace condemnation if we want. Jesus never said to embrace condemnation. So it's not about condemnation. It's not even about being good with your morals or being a really good Christian. And sometimes when you hear this message taught, it'd be, it, it's like... You know, just be a better Christian. No, 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 no. Realize you're the vessel of divine life in Jesus, meant as a dispenser to give that life away. 
And so we're just going to ask God to give us an eye to see and a heart that corresponds with what we see. So, Father, we pray right now as the body of Christ here in this location. We thank you that you have enough grace for all of us here. You have enough mercy for all of us here. But we also know that there are a lot of people that are broken. There's also a lot of religious people that walk on by and justify it a lot of different ways. We don't want to be those people. We want to be people that roll up our sleeves, get in the dirt with people for as long as it takes to bring healing and wholeness and transformation in the name of Jesus. And Father, as a body right now, we pray. I pray for Ruby. Everybody say Ruby's name. Ruby. This woman gave so sacrificially, Father, and I looked at her and I wanted to guarantee it. I wanted so bad to guarantee it. But I believe it. I believe she'll have a son. We contend for her, God. We contend for a child, a son, for Ruby. And so, Father, help us continue to pray, continue to go, and continue to give on mission. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. All right, church, I love you. You're dismissed. Have an awesome rest of the day.